Welcome to The Radical Therapist. This is your host, Dr. Chris Hoff, and today we are out and about in Washington, D.C., and behind me there is the Smithsonian uh, Museum of African American History and Culture, and I'm about to go in there and I'm going to take you with me, but before we do that, I thought this would be a good opportunity to talk about a couple of topics uh, that I'll probably cover on the show more than once, and that is uh, today, uh, white fragility and then white privilege. Controversial, I know, uh, so bear with me, but I thought uh, we could start by talking before we go into the museum about white fragility, uh, because I think it's an important topic, because if we're going to make any progress uh, in kind of undoing systems of oppression in our country, uh, white people are going to have to thicken up a little bit. And what I mean by that, they're just gonna have to be, uh, uh, expand their tolerance and, and ability to sit in uncomfortable conversations and so and that it means taking on what is being called now white fragility I know that's not going to go over well with people I understand uh, but it's important and so what is white fragility white fragility is a term created by dr. Robin D'Angelo and she stated that white people in North America live in social environments that protect them from race-based stress uh, and uh, white people or white fragility is a state in which a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable triggering a range of defensive moves uh, by white people so I'm going to share a little bit about what those moves are because uh, we need to be aware of them when uh, we're having these difficult conversations and these things start to happen. So what are these moves, these defensive moves that we do uh, when we're experiencing race-based stress? Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about changing the subject. Um, oftentimes, um, when these subjects come up, when we're talking about, say, unarmed black men getting uh, killed by police, or, uh, you know, the, what, you know, what's going down, the protests in Ferguson or something like that. Oftentimes people want to change the subject to something more positive, something more um, not so negative is how it gets characterized. And uh, that is a, a, a defensive move, would be considered a defensive move of changing the subject, calling race talk, all race talk negative. And what we need to do is be able to um, uh, be comfortable in having those conversations. Uh, another defensive move, and I think this is really an important one, and one that I have wrestled with in my own life, uh, and that is the, the ability, or this defensive move, of being able to lead the conversation. You know, I've come to the realization that me as a white male, oftentimes I don't have to participate in these difficult conversations if I don't want to, uh, uh, whereas people of color don't have that option. They don't have that privilege. Uh, so my task at hand is um, to realize that uh, conversations about race and oppression are hard and that I need to be uh, in the midst of that, in that difficulty, and be uncomfortable, be okay with being uncomfortable, uh, be okay with getting called out, be okay with uh, when I make a mistake in uh, language or uh, whatever, be okay and not let it crumble me in a way that I leave the conversation, but that I, that I just correct and keep moving forward. Uh, third uh, one is uh, getting defensive or angry. Uh, and how this works is I, I heard somebody say recently that the worst thing you could uh, t uh, t call a white liberal left person is a racist, and uh, which is probably true. Uh, nobody likes to be called a racist, and, it, and, what, and what that does is it, cre it prohibits people from examining their own racism, which I think is really, really important and not a bad thing, right? This is how we, we got to make it visible, make it be aware of it, and then we don't reproduce it in the ways that we reproduce it. And so, um, uh, so you, oftentimes you'll hear people say when they're getting uh, defensive or angry, I've had it, I've had it hard too. I'm a white person. I didn't come up, and it would be easy for me to do that. I'm actually, well, you probably don't know, I'm. I've had a history of kind of uh, somewhat juvenile delinquency. I was a high school dropout. Uh, it would be easy for me to say, hey, I haven't had it so easy either. But the reality is, is that I have access to, well, you don't have to be a racist to benefit from racism, right? And so another way or, uh, you could call these other people, people that are calling you out as being unreasonable. You can make the argument that why is everything about race? Some of these things are the way that we be defensive. And finally, the last kind of uh, defensive move that I want to talk about is the idea of getting lost in white guilt or getting lost in your whiteness. Um, 
and being rendered ineffectual. I think guilt doesn't, isn't going to do anybody any good any, here. Um, it's not worthwhile. It'll just continue to keep these systems of impression in place. It's not going to help anybody, yourself included. So uh, abandon the guilt. Not, not worthwhile. Um, and that's not what we're not trying to do here. We're not trying to blame or shame anybody into action. This is about just becoming aware, being okay with being uncomfortable, and, uh, and staying in, in the midst of these difficult conversations as we move to unravel, undo systemic uh, racism, oppression, etc. So anyway, that's my quick pitch on white fragility, probably not the last time, and uh, let's go into the museum. All right.
everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed the tour of the museum. I certainly did. It was very powerful. Um, yeah, lots of emotions and uh, very informative. Uh, great museum. If you get a chance to come to, and you're in DC, I highly recommend you get over there. I thought I'd finish off this video doing a quick little pitch on uh, white privilege um, with the Lincoln Memorial in the background. So um, for those that don't know, white privilege uh, was a term coined by a Wellesley professor Peggy McIntosh, which refers to a certain uh, unearned benefits um, or certain unearned privileges in life that people of color are not afforded. Uh, and an example of this might be, I just read this morning a uh, study in the Bureau of Labor Statistics that a black uh, college student has the same chance of getting a job as a high school, a white high school dropout. Uh, that could be considered a particular case of uh, white privilege. Uh, as a high school dropout, you have uh, an equal chance of getting a job as a black college student. So, uh, but if you want to know more about um, white privilege and how that really looks, I recommend Peggy McIntosh's book, White Privilege, and uh, she has a section on unpacking the knapsack of privilege. And it can give you a lot of different other different ways that this shows up. So um, now I know there's a lot of controversy around this topic. Uh, a lot of people think privilege doesn't exist that it's just an ideology, um, that it just isn't out there, or you know, a lot of what's happening now is people are pointing to white rural America and saying, see, there, you have a large uh, population of white people that are experiencing hardship and uh, so white privilege doesn't really exist. But I would say to these folks that you know, these things that are happening in white rural communities like drug addiction, unemployment, poverty, have been happening in, in black communities for years, uh, for, since forever, really. So um, uh, I just don't think it it, it, uh, it it measures up. So for those that would say that white privilege or white supremacy does not exist, I'm going to reference one of my favorite philosophers, Bruno Latour, who said, uh, what is real resists. And this is why I don't believe it to be an ideology at all because uh, what is real resists and you just look for this resistance and, and we can find it today and all its full glory in the great America make America great again movement which uh, I, I don't know when America was great I don't know if they're asking us flat point blank to just roll back civil rights to roll back LGBTQ rights to roll back um, women's rights um, I'm, I'm not sure what they're asking for <laughs> well, I, I have an idea playing kind of dumb, but uh, you see it in the uh, anti-social justice movement. Um, I get off, and I've been accused uh, recently of being a social justice warrior, which is okay by me. I don't know what the alternative is, uh, but you see it in this movement and um, people that uh, say there is no privilege feeling threatened that something might be taken away. I don't get that really, but uh, but I would say that if, if this anti-social justice movement uh, who are they trying to silence, right? Who are they trying to silence? I mean, look to that, and that's where you might find some resistance. Um, and I would say to them also, I, uh, there's a favorite meme of mine going around that says, when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. And I think that's what's happening to some of these, like the men's rights groups, the anti, you know, uh, the people that would call me a snowflake. Um, I think in reality, they're really struggling with uh, this, uh, this sense of, uh, uh, when you're used to privilege, equality feels like oppression. So uh, you can also see it in the continued criminalization, uh, or you can see this resistance in the cr continued criminalization of people of color, be it the war on immigration, uh, the Muslim ban, or now the federal government making noises about uh, undoing legalization of marijuana. We know what happened uh, last time with the mass incarceration of people of color. So. You know, uh, I want to say to everybody, especially the white people out there, listen, recognizing privilege doesn't make you an asshole, okay? That's not what this is about. This is not about that. Blame making you an asshole. You're a terrible white person. That's not what this is about. What this is about is hopefully making uh, privilege visible. So you might become aware that many people do not have access to many of the things that you and I take for granted and that in turn, you might be willing to do something about it and that we're not a threat and that we don't need to take it personal and that uh, 
when we lift others up, we lift all, all ourselves up. Uh, and that's just how it goes. And I'm a firm believer in that. So, so thanks for watching. This has been a special edition in Washington, a Radical Therapist in Washington, D.C. Please subscribe. Please click like. Please comment. Please share with your friends, colleagues. And I'll have more content coming at you, no doubt. So thanks for watching. My name is Chris Hoff. Thanks for watching.